now we are um, start this uh, session and uh, uh, I'm very happy to introduce our first uh, speaker, uh, uh, Professor Anson Donchev. So he's going to talk about teaching and advertising variational analysis. Okay, thank you, please go ahead. Thank you very much, thank you very much. Well, uh, I'm assuming that uh, you see this first slide. It describes the title and brief CV. <laughs> Most mm -hmm. of you knows me as an editor from uh, editor working at Mathematical Reviews. I retired uh, last year. I'm affiliated with University of Michigan with the Department of Aerospace Engineering and Department of Mathematics. I'm kind of associate researcher there, mainly because of these two grants we'll be having with the uh, colleagues from the Department of Aerospace Engineering. And also I have a position in the Department of Mathematics at University of Florida, where I started about 30 years ago, my career here in the, in the United States. I was there uh, 89, 90 as a visitor and then back last year. Okay, why this talk? Teaching and advertising, why? Well, uh, last fall, in the last spring, the spring this year, I had a graduate course in the Department of Mathematics and Informatics at Sofia University, Bulgaria. And I'm, I was very uh, interested to uh, interact with uh, graduate students there and teaching what? Variational analysis. This was my uh, first attempt to uh, to teach this thing, this, this subject. And uh, I had a very uh, memorable experience with uh, the young students. They're very keen to know. There were, not, there, were, there were not so many, there were about 10, maybe 15. Actually half of them were only students, were, were students, the rest were faculty or some other people coming from other universities. So this is the first, uh, the first answer why this talk. I would like to share with you my experience with teaching variational analysis at the graduate uh, course. Also, um, another source of this inspiration came from interactions with students and faculty from the University of Michigan, mainly from the Department of Aerospace Engineering, where I have uh, a very close connection. Uh, we work on various projects funded by uh, NSF and Air Force. Actually, uh, this graduate course, uh, I was supposed to, to teach this graduate course this spring, this coming spring semester in 21, but uh, COVID happened and other things, a lot of uh, uncertainty, so this was postponed to a later date. Also, I, I met and talked with colleagues and interacted with, in, including uh, colleagues from Australia and talk, uh, gave various talk at conferences and seminars about certain subject on this topic. And finally, when I was going over my lecture notes from this, uh, from this uh, graduate course I had, I asked myself, why not a book project? Of course, this is still hanging in the, uh, in the air. I'm not quite sure whether there, there will be a book or not, but why not think about that? Okay, and I will ask many, many questions during this talk and I would like to share your thoughts with, with me about all this. Okay, so the first question is, of course, what is variational analysis? And the short answer is to look at Wikipedia. 
This is what is given in Wikipedia. The, in mathematics, the term of reaction analysis usually denotes the combination and extension of methods from convex optimization in the classical calculus of variation to a more general theory, more than what? Well, uh, supposedly from more uh, general than convex optimization in the classical, oh, the first sentence is not quite good. This includes the more general problems of optimization theory, including topics in set value analysis, for example, generalized de derivatives. So, um, so the variation analysis includes optimization theory, topics in set value analysis, and, uh, like generalized uh, uh, derivatives, and de the generalized derivatives are what? Are part of set value analysis? Well, I'm not very happy about this. Uh, definition, but, but anyway, this is what is in Wikipedia. Uh, I have a, another uh, answer to that uh, question, what is variational analysis? Uh, everything which is, what is contained in this book here, the, the picture uh, uh, depicting the, the book Variational Analysis, which uh, appeared 20-something uh, years ago by Terry Rockefeller and Roger Wetz. So let's state this as a definition. But I would like to warn you that there is an earlier book called Variational Analysis. And don't mix these two things. Morse, Marston Morse, the famous one with the Morse theorem, published a book, which is basically about uh, calculus of variations in the large and uh, differential geometry. And this book appeared in 73. And here's a picture of this book. So, but this is not the variational analysis we we're gonna talk about. And there are more books that appeared in between uh, uh, the book of Terry and, and Roger. The first one is of course, before the uh, book of Terry. Uh, this is the book of Oban and Frankowska, set value analysis. And I'm inclined to consider set value analysis as a part or a companion to variational analysis. But this is, of course, all uh, just um, uh, doesn't have to be that way. Uh, another book, which is uh, very in the, in the center of the uh, variational analysis, is the book of Klati and Kumar where they, they collected today uh, results in uh, on non smooth analysis. Then comes borrowing in Zhu, techniques of variational analysis, which gives another perspective to uh, topics uh, and techniques of variational analysis. Uh, Boris Mordukovic published a two-part treaty, variational analysis and generalized dif di and differentiation, where now general definition the general differentiation is separate from variational analysis, but probably not. Uh, I don't think that Boris thought that way when writing the book. And there is a book, and uh, there is there is a book with my book with Terry, which uh, is uh, which uh, is about implicit function and solution mapping, which appeared in two thousand and nine. The second edition was in two thousand and fourteen. And um, this book is behind the lecture notes I uh, gave, uh, the lecture notes I had, I, I, I wrote uh, on the basis of my graduate course in Sofia. But it's different, it's a different book. It's, it's, uh, you'll see why. Okay, and then the, the book of Ali Kioffer, Variational Analysis and of Regular Mappings, which appeared in 17. And finally, the second book of Boris Morikovich, Variational Analysis Applications, which appeared in 2018. So there are quite a few books, but I would rather say that none of this book taken by itself, I, could use as a, for my graduate course. Um, it, they're simply 
too involved, too complicated, in particular for students that are not mathematicians by, edu by education. Well, what, okay, suppose I, I agree, I agree to teach this course. So the first question is where to start from? Should I, should I assume some familiarity with functional analysis? Where to go with, without functional analysis? What, what uh, in particular, if you want to talk about regularity of mappings, uh, I'll come to that later. Uh, okay, and then it comes the, 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 the basic question, finite versus infinite dimension. Shall we do infinite dimensions? Well, I, I have to do it because I want it very much to include in this uh, class, in this uh, course, optimal control as an application. So, so what application shall we consider in this course, in such a course? Applications in optimization, well, mathematical programming, finite dimensional optimization, applications in optimal control, this is my, uh, so to say, uh, I'm coming from optimal control and this is my uh, the, the, uh, field which is very dear to my heart, so I cannot just skip it. Numerical analysis, another thing I'm very much uh, interested in, and also approximation to other specific areas like approximation theory, differential inclusions, feedback control, and uh, so on. So then we have to, I had to first answer this, this questions before starting the class, but then it started a little bit chaotic and I, I'll show you now what happened. So <clears throat> as a team one, uh, in, this, in this lecture notes and in this class, I uh, so uh, was the, 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 the properties, the continuity properties side value of magnum. So we, 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 we started with continuity of set value, set value mappings and continuity of set value mappings. Uh, what kind of continuity, of course? Uh, well, there are two basic kinds, I would say, Pompeo Hausdorff and the Penlevec Kuratowski continuity. One is metric, the other one is more kind of topological, kind of, and they're different, and they're different. And I want, when I introduced this uh, uh, properties, continuity properties, I, I had to, uh, uh, I, I, I wanted immediately to find an application. And of course, the most uh, kind of, uh, the most obvious application in optimization regarding continuity property of set value mappings in the Birch theorem, which is regarding the continuity properties of uh, the optimal value and the optimal solution mapping of, uh, of this minimization problems, this optimization problem uh, where uh, depending on parameter P. So here the function depends on P and the decision variable X and uh, the set D, the set of constraints also depends on P. So in, well, I, I've chosen to work in metric spaces and I had to introduce metric spaces at this point. And then uh, here is the Bersh theorem, which everybody knows. Uh, if the main assumption about the set is it's non that the value of D, the, the feasible set is non-empty and compact, the value of the feasible set mapping is non-empty and uh, the feasible set at the point P bar is non-empty and compact. And the mapping D is Penleve, uh, is uh, uh, Pompeo Hausdorff continuous. It's important that it's Pompeo Hausdorff continuous. And then the function G is continuous at the reference point for every X in this set here. And then if we have these two assumptions, that the optimal value mapping is continuous, whereas the optimal solution mapping is upper semi-continuous or outer semi-continuous. You, you choose the definition. In the, 
in my in the class I used upper and lower semi-continuity because the if if the student knew something about set value map mappings, they knew about upper and lower semi-continuity. So I decided to go soft on that. Okay, here is the, of course, uh, I presented the proof of this theorem. Uh, but, and then I, uh, look what happened. Then I uh, gave some homeworks to the students of the class and uh, the, actually the final grade was composed by three uh, components. The first was the homework which was given to each student separately. There are only nine students, so I didn't have much trouble in generating nine problems for the software, for the, uh, for homework. Then the second comes uh, the, the final exam, which was another problem. Remember, I was in Anarba and I was teaching in Sofia, Bulgaria, so this was online teaching, but they use Moodle, they don't use Zoom, which was another complications, uh, complication of, of all this communication. And then uh, uh, I, uh, in, in, I gave uh, one, uh, to one of the students uh, to, uh, find, to prove a version of Bert's theorem where the function G does not depend on P. So we have this problem here, minimize g of x subject to x in d of p. And now uh, what, what I knew there is a theorem by Berdyshev, Berdyshev Russian mathematician from the 70s, 1970s. Uh, this theorem was proved, which claims the following. Suppose that the mapping is Penevek-Korotovsky continuous. We don't have here the compactness requ requirement, which is very important because compactness is something terrible, in particular in infinite dimensional optimization and optimal control. It's a little bit too much. And then the function g is only continuous, uh, continuous at, at here x. This is a typo here, x should be without parentheses. And without, for every x, bar in this uh, feasible set. And then the optimal value mapping is continuous, whereas the optimal solution mapping is upper semi continuous. Of course, this is upper semi continuity is in the Penelovec or Tosky sense. And I gave this, this problem uh, the theory, to prove the theorem of Berdyshev without telling him that this is this theorem is, is known and it's proved by Berdyshev. And, uh, and, and also I made a mistake. I didn't specify the, the sense in which the mapping D is continuous. So I just wrote proof that this is, this is true, provided that the mapping D is continuous. And before, the giving this homework, I was talking about Pendevec Kortovsky, uh, about, about uh, Pompeo Hausdorff continuity, and quite naturally, uh, Stoyan assumed that I have in mind Pompeo Hausdorff continuity in the metric space. So we are in me metric spaces here. And Stoyan, to my uh, amazement, found a counterexample couldn't, couldn't uh, generate a proof because he found a counter example in the case when D is Pompeo Hauser, uh, in the case when D is Pompeo Hauser continues and show that uh, an additional assumption on G is needed in this case. Of course, this assumption was present in the Berdyshev work. I, I totally forgot about this. And the, the assumption was that G is not only continuous, but uniformly continuous in X bar. I urged uh, Stoyan to write uh, this uh, counterexample uh, uh, within a paper about uh, this problem here. Uh, 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 and also he uh, generated an additional assumption 
on G, which is weaker than uh, the uh, uniform continuity as in Berdyshev paper and uh, in the paper of Stoyanis on the way. Stoyanis uh, graduate students, uh, PhD students at South University. So something which uh, have, has never happened to me before to give a not quite well specified homework to a student. And instead of the homework, instead of the proof to get a, a country example. Well, this is this was really a lot of fun for me. And my question is: Do you have do you have something like that? Did you happen to you? And this very much inspired me to be more in more careful and inventive in my homeworks. Okay, the second topic in in continuity property is of course Lipschitz continuity and immediate replication. This, this was a very important part of this class. When I talk about, when I give definition, I immediately look for application. I think this was a good approach and the student appreciated that. And this application was the well-known fact that every polyhedral convex mapping in finite dimension, of course, is Lipschitz continuous in its domain. This is based on Hoffman lemma, well known Hoffman lemma, which is uh, I supplied, which I supplied to the proof. And a further application was uh, in linear programming regarding this problem of linear programming with a parameter in the constraints, the parameter Y in the constraints. So in this case, it, based on this uh, Hoffman lemma, and Lipschitz continuity of the of the uh, feasible set, uh, we can prove that the optimal value and the optimal set mappings are Lipschitz continuous with respect to Y. The next step was to introduce the upper Lipschitz continuity in the sense of Robinson, who, in his famous theorem, proved that. Every piecewise polyhedral mapping, I call it piecewise polyhedral. This is actually a polyhedral uh, mapping whose graph is the union of polyhedral convex sets. So the piecewise polyhedral mappings, uh, uh, are there, there are upper Lipschitz continuous by Robinson's theorem. And an important implication is, of course, important example is the normal con mapping to a polyhedral convex set. So we go into nonlinear programming with this. Okay, we come to time two, which is about regularity, regularity of mapping. And I was talking about, I, I had, I considered the following types of regularity, metric regularity, of course, metric subregularity or just subregularity, strong regularity in, as defined, by Robinson, but in a little bit different context, and strong subregularity. So uh, there's four kinds of regularity. And what applications I considered about uh, 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 applications to feasibility and optimality mappings in optimization, such as constraint qualifications, and solution stability and optimization. I have in mind basically Lipschitz stability. And as further topics, I considered variational inequalities, general equation, numerical optimization, nonlinear programming, and optimal control. So this all is the crux of the of the of the lecture notes. My favorite topic: regularity, and not only mine regularity of mappings and how they have applications in optimization and optimal control. And now, you know, on the way to present regularity, I had to prove and go over and prove a lot of theorems, uh, too many, according to some of my students. We, have, we had too many theorems, but not too many examples. So the first comes the Lustein and Grace theorem about the uh, invariance or uh, persistence of, of, of metric regularity under re linearization. 
Then come, uh, comes Robinson Rosescu theorem, which is about uh, mapping with convex graphs where metric regularity is characterized by interior point condition. Very important theorem. The another theorem by Robinson about strong regularity. You know, Robinson's uh, names is mentioned uh, quite a few times here, quite a few times here. I, I, I really admired his creativity about, about regularity of mappings. And then something I uh, is very close to me is uh, stability of strong subregularity in the same uh, vein of uh, uh, persistence of the property under linearization. Then comes the Bartle-Graves theorem. The Bartle-Graves theorem is about uh, mappings that are metric, metrically regular, and the inverse has a locally convex graph. And in that case, uh, the, the mapping uh, has a continuous selection, the, which the mapping, the inverse mapping, sorry, the inverse mapping of, of the metrically regular mapping has a continuous selection. And then, of, of course, applications of all these theorems in optimization and optimal control. Well, then I stop at, at, at this subject here. Then after giving this, uh, I, 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 I spend a lot of uh, some time about uh, uh, comparing metric regularity to strong regularity, namely, I showed them a very uh, uh, kind of light version of the fact. Light, light mean light is in the sense here as a light beer, you know, uh, not not really rigorous, but just you know, with hands waking and saying, eh, because this is the, this is so and so on. So this result with, uh, by, by Terry Rockefeller and me from 96, uh, which shows that from, for mappings of the form, a matrix A plus the normal cone mapping to a, uh, to a set which is polyhedral, uh, uh, the metric regularity is the same as strong regularity. And then a locally monotone mappings and the KAT mapping, the mapping in Nonlinear programming uh, that that also has this this property, and here I give them a more rigorous proof, but actually this um, this follows from this first fact here. Okay, I don't hear question answers or questions from you. Uh, please interact me interrupt me whenever you feel something is. Uh, not clear, or, or if you want to answer to, to the question, uh, I, I give, uh, I'll, be, I'll be glad to hear it immediately instead of waiting for. Uh, uh, Sen, the problem is we're all muted. Like, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, okay. Yeah, everybody has these little red things saying they're muted, but so. Uh, I could. Yeah, no, you, I, you, can, you can unmute yourself. I don't know. Yeah, anyway, I unmute myself here. I can mute myself back when I uh, don't want to yeah. talk. Uh, so um, uh, I would just like to make a little comment here. I'm understanding all, all of this and, and your direction, and I know you so well and why you're doing this. But for example, if this is going to be some kind of introduction to variational analysis, don't you need a subgradient? There's some other aspects of the subject. This is all on the kind of continuity side of the variational. This analysis. is this is coming in uh, uh, theme three. Okay. Okay. All right. I'll, I'll mute so myself. This is, this is theme two regularity. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And this is coming in theme three. And yeah. Theme three is generalized differentiation. Okay. Okay. And. And now again, I, I, everything is set to all your mappings. Yes. No. Do you have no. A function no. and an epigraph, for example. You ever have an epigraph or? Uh, yes. Yes. I. Okay. This is right. in, uh, okay. So I had a, I have a big dilemma. What to say about generalized differentiation? 
Right. And I finally I decided to talk only about generalized definitions of functions. Yeah, because that's right. going into uh, set valued mappings requires a lot of techni technique, a lot of special tricks, and uh, a lot of uh, uh, new concepts. And I had right. only right. one semester for this for this talk. So of course, of course. Uh, no, so I, mean, I, I talk about subgradients. I started with subgradients, direction, differentiability. And then move into things, into the concept of generalized differentiation that I, I will, I'll need later, like semi differentiability, which I need in order to show that uh, nonlinear programming problems, the solution mapping and the nonlinear programming pro uh, problem under certain conditions is semi differentiable or B differentiable. Yeah. Then I had to introduce the generalized uh, Clark generalized uh, Jacobian in order to consider the, the semi-smooth Newton method. And then I, I, I introduced the strict graphical derivative in order to give a characterization of the strong metric regularity. Because this is probably one of the most uh, beautiful parts of strong regularity when you have uh, actually, uh, which again goes back to Robinson, when you have a very pure, very nice, uh, basically algebraic characterization of the strong regularity of the nonlinear programming problem. I'll mention something about that. Yeah. Okay, and I'm gonna again for yeah. now. And you this is stand three. This was uh, another part of the third part of, of, of the third theme of, of, of this course, of this uh, uh, series of lectures. Okay, so what more? Well, contingent derivative, co-derivative, criteria for metric regularity and strong subregularity. Probably yes, but only if I have enough time. But we have not much time during the semester, in particular with the COVID uh, complications. And here I'd like to mention one result, which I think it was kind of overlooked, but I, I very much like it, mainly because it's mine and, and Helen Frankowska's results. So uh, forget about metric regularity and stuff and consider uh, mapping arctic in finite dimensions. Uh, suppose that we have a reference point in this mapping and assume that the graph of F is locally close around this point. This means that if you intersect with a, with a ball around this point, the intersection is closed. Then you have the following equality. To the left is limb soup of the inverse of the outer norm of the, of the outer norm of the inverse of the contingent derivative. At, and here is a type of, should be X bar, Y bar at x bar, y bar. No, 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 sorry, no, mistake. x, y, and x and y goes to x bar, y bar along the graph of f. This is exactly, if this is finite, this is exactly the contingent derivative criterion for metric regularity. And to the right, this is the, the inner norm, the plus norm, of the inverse of the co-derivative. And this is, this is exactly the co-derivative or Morikovic criterion, if you want, uh, for metric regularity. And these two things are equal. This, this, this is the theorem, which uh, without mentioning about metric regularity. Okay, and this, of course, they, they are equal because this is uh, finite, if and only if we have metric regularity, and this is finite, if and only if we have metric regularity. So they must be, they, there must be both, both, uh, both finite, but not necessarily equal. But it turns out they are equal. And in this case, if we prove, you will prove the first criterion, you immediately get the second criterion, the co-derivative 
as a cavalry. And uh, vice versa, if you prove the second one, you get the first one. So this is kind of nice. And I, I intended to, to present this, but I, I, I couldn't, there's not enough time. But I like it and uh, I would be happy if somebody else uses it. Uh, I'll say I'm sorry, this is Boris. Uh, yeah. I would like to mention, this is a very final dimensional results, right? You cannot yes. get stuff in even dimension. Right? I don't know. This I don't know. I didn't try. But it seems to me like that. But anyway, okay, thank you. Okay, I don't, I don't know. But this is uh, indeed proved in finite dimensions. It will be interesting to prove it in infinite dimension probably. Okay, applications. So the main motivation in this graduate class uh, comes from optimization, finite dimensional optimization and also mathematical programming and also optimal control. So what applications could we consider here and what I did? The first was the constraint qualification, the Mangasarian from its condition for nonlinear programming problem, which is very fundamental to get the Lagrange multiplier rule. And how I did it, I just applied first the Robinson or Sesco theorem to the uh, feasibility set given by inequalities and inequalities. And then I applied the, the first I applied the, the the Sterling Graves theorem pass to the linearization of this feasibility. And then I applied Robinson Osesco. And from Robinson Osesco, I got immediately the Mangasarian from this condition. So this is a nice application of both the Sterling Graves and uh, Robinson Osesco. Then Lipschitz stability in, in nonlinear programming. We cannot go anywhere without that. This is, this is the, probably the most important applications because it, it also opens the way to proving convergence of numerical methods for solving this problem. So we have here a problem, a finite dimensional problem to minimize a function depending on parameter P over X satisfying this inequality and equality constraints. And this is something probably everybody knows this, but it was proven in this class that sufficient and sometimes also necessary conditions, conditions for a condition for strong regularity or equivalently for Lipschitz, uh, a strong regularity of the, uh, of, the, of, the, of the optimality mapping or equivalently Lipschitz stability of this problem uh, is the combination of the following two conditions. The gradient of the active constraints are linearly independent and the strong second order sufficient condition holds, which is written here. This theorem also belongs to Robinson. And I think it's a, it's a must if you want to talk about uh, regularity and if you want to talk about Lipschitz stability and also uh, about convergence of algorithms. Okay, applications to numerical, another application, applications to numerical analysis. So I considered, uh, considered uh, to look at the Newton's method first, including the semi-smooth Newton method, then go into proximal point and some projection methods and go into some path following method for a parameterized um, uh, nonlinear programming problem. And finally, my favorite uh, outside optimization is the constraint approximation, which is a uh, beautiful applications of duality and semi-smooth Newton to a problem which looks uh, uh, from a different area, but actually it's a very much optimization problem when you want to approximate a function subject to certain constraints. 
for example, the function is convex and the approximation must be convex. I didn't, I was only able to cover the first topic, but I uh, would consider the other thing, the other, th the other uh, topics here very attractive to, to put into such a class. No questions yet? Okay. I'm, uh, I, I have, I have one hour for this talk. Thank you, the organizer, to give me so much time. My talk is not that long and we'll have a lot of time after the talk, I am assuming, to go into critical, I emphasize this, critical comments of everything I'm talking about, uh, suggestions for improvements, and also uh, suggestions for corrections, changes, and, uh, and other things. Okay, so I, uh, uh, the next things I put in the, in these lectures was uh, about the Newton method. Met, uh, first I introduced the generalized equation as a more general form of say the optimality conditions in nonlinear programming. This is in, in Banach spaces. Here is the, the generalized equation and the Newton method is and the following iteration, everybody knows, we solve a linearized generalized equation where d is the derivative of f and we, uh, and we take this iteration here and this is exactly the Newton method if the, the set value mapping capital F is zero, is the zero mapping and it's uh, SQP if this is the normal cone mapping to say uh, a convex enclosed set of constraints. And uh, if it is K, KT mapping, it's becoming more the, the more known form of SQP. So here's the theorem I uh, prove for this case. Uh, Consider this generalized equation one, which is not one here, this is a typo. Under the standing assumptions here, and assume that the mapping small f plus capital F is metrically regular. Then there exists a constant delta, such that for every starting point in this ball here with radius delta, there exists a sequence contained in this ball and generated by this Newton method, which is contained in the ball and is quadratically convergent to the solution X bar. Remember we are, X bar is a solution of this generalized equation. And in the case of strong regularity, the sequence is, the, this sequence is unique in the ball, uh, uh, in the ball B delta X bar. Uh, this uh, immediately gives uh, conditions for convergence of the SQP method, namely you take the sufficient conditions for strong regularity, for, for example, and then uh, you, get, you get convergence of the SQP. And if you take metric regularity, in this case, uh, a nonlinear programming problem, you end up with strong regularity again because in this case, strong regularity and uh, metric regularity are the same property. So be careful when you use strong uh, metric regularity. It may happen that they are the same properties. They are the same property. Okay, and finally, uh, this last part of the lecture notes, which I was able to cover only, in which I was able to cover only the first two topics, are applications to control. This comes from my interaction with the people, students and faculty from the University of Michigan. 
which are very interested in applying variational analysis, generalized differentiation to their problems, their practical problems, problems of uh, landing a satellite on a, a stairway, problem of landing a helicopter on a ship, or a problem of landing a Falcon 9 on the uh, on the on the on the on, on the ground. This you 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 you've seen, I'm sure, this uh, landings, quite a few of them uh, that uh, SpaceX did uh, in the past couple of years, maybe more. And I can tell you that they use optimal control for that, for all these problems. Of course, there is various part of it, various uh, 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 various uh, um, theorems and uh, various topics of optimal control. So what I did is I first took the the most popular maybe and the simplest to consider problem of optimal control, the linear quadratic problem, optimal control problems where the the functional to be minimized is quadratic and the system is linear. But I put constraints in the control and this makes the things non-trivial in the context of optimal control because constraints, as we know, complicates the matter tremendously. Actually, cons constraints make uh, make the variational analysis necessary uh, in, the, in the extent we know it now. The constraints not only in, this is well known, not only in, 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 in optimal control, but also in optimization, uh, in the fine dimensional optimization. Uh, but in the control in particular, because what, what is different uh, between the calculus of variation and the contragence principle are the constraints the presence of constraints. This is the big, the big difference. So uh, I presented the linear quadratic optimal control in full, working in infinite dimensional spaces and uh, deriving the maximum principle for constraints in the uh, and the control in the form of a closed and convex set. And then I um, proved properties of the solution, namely under cursivity, the optimal control is Lipschitz continuous in time. And this opens the door to studying discrete approximations of this problem. So substituting the initial problem by a finite dimensional approximation of it and asking the question whether the solution of this discrete, this approximation is an approximation of the solution of the original problem. This is the basic problem in, in numerical analysis, a basic problem in numerical analysis. Okay. I mentioned that I didn't go, I didn't come to discrete approximation in my class, but I mentioned something about regularity in nonlinear uh, control. Namely, uh, <clears throat> I consider a, a, a visible set mapping uh, cons consisting of uh, inequality constraints for the state and the control, and applying uh, applying the the the, the trick I knew I presented before of using the Robinson Rosescu theorem and together with the Lustavin Grace theorem, I found uh, constraint qualification conditions for this problem with the inequality constraints for the state 
and control. And in particular, for uh, I showed the metric regularity of this mapping, the mapping of constraints, the constraint mapping in optimal control, in nonlinear control. And also, we have a nonlinear system uh, described by nonlinear differential equation, ordinary differential equation. I didn't go into PDEs into, in, in this class. OK, then I, I'm thinking in, in this book to be, maybe, I'm thinking of adding discrete approximations to both the linear quadratic optimal control as an introduction, and then the nonlinear control as a further development. Then uh, I'm considering the treating the question of the existence of an optimal feedback control. This is something which uh, is a very, very basic problem in control theory. And there are some recent advances, in particular, this joint papers with these people here. I mentioned about this, which shows the existence of optimal feedback control for a nonlinear system with control constraints shows conditions under which, and these conditions are quite natural, for existence of optimal feedback control. And finally, I'm very much tempted to include something about model predictive control. This is a booming area where there are so many new mathematical problems that appear, in particular problems in optimization in finite dimension optimization, but also mainly problems in optimal control. What is model predictive control? It's, it's, it's hard to describe it in, in uh, five minutes I have, but this is um, something which is very intriguing for mathematicians. Uh, and I would like to mention that the last two sections are based on uh, joint papers with Ilya Komonovsky and my uh, collaborations from Bulgaria, Mikhail Krastanov and Vladimir Belyov. This is unfinished yet, just, uh, just, uh, ju just sketched. Okay, please share your thoughts. We, uh, there's, you know, I, I realize, I know that this is a very known standard topic, but what do you think about teaching variation analysis uh, this way or other way? And thank you. Well, Sam, what I, what I see right away in all of this is, uh, that, um, well, all, just about all of us have taught some kind of advanced course. And when you teach an advanced course, you're always faced with these things like, the students don't have the background you really want. That's how much should you do to make up for the background they're missing? And there's also the question of what to cover. And uh, what I see in, in this is, uh, it's so important, your motivation to deal eventually with optimal control. Because, it, but, but, but you know, how much can you fit? These are all, all things that are kind of, so, so you're, you're trying very hard to select just the right topics going, going up to that. You know, if I were writing a book that was an introduction to variational analysis in general, I would first of all, but you know me, I've gotten kind of finite dimensional, I would forego all the infinite dimensional things because they just add so many complications that get in the way and take up yeah. so much time. But you have to do it, as you say, for your control thing. So I, I think this is a very interesting. I, I, I wonder because if anyone the, yeah, on subject of right. variational analysis. Yes. Yeah, because this the, the, the consumers are coming from there. You know, with these yeah. people, you know, they want to know that. And yeah. I, I've, I've written a number of papers and uh, work on a number of projects with these people, and they're fascinating with fascinated with, with uh, variational analysis. They want to know yeah. it. They want to, to apply it to yeah. their problems. <clears throat> and I, I kind of, you know, and besides I have this control background, which 
kind of uh, yes. Oh, yes. just me apply. That's true. Yeah. That, that's true, Terry. And another thing was this part of regularity. You know, what is metric regularity? What is what is the standing place? Uh, yeah. This is just an application of the banner hopping mapping principle. But how to present banner hopping mapping principle in finite dimensions? You know, <laughs> yeah. sounds sounds like travesty. Yeah. <laughs> Also, Robinson and Sesco, which is again another application of Banach Hopping Mapping Principle. Right. And it, 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 it so works. Some of your bubble waves well. or some of those things are, go beyond what you would really need for this purpose. I, yeah. I, I wonder if you didn't get too carried away with metric regularity at some point. Uh, if, no. if, you know, that distracted you. Yeah, from maybe. And to optimal control. Did you need all of it? Well, um, probably not, but uh, not, not everything in optimal uh, metric regularity, but I prove a theorem about metric regularity of the feasible set mapping. And from them, from there, I, I derive a constraint amplification in nonlinear uh, non optimal control, which I think is yeah. good good um, i don't know i kind of want to want to prove things right and you know this these people in this engineering department they're exposed to so many approximate you know uh, uh, assertions and things that are not really proved uh, correctly, uh, or maybe not correctly, fully or rigorously proved. And I want, wanted this to be a math course, after all, where we have theorems and proofs, maybe too many theorems. They are not used to these theorems. I don't know if and when I'm going to teach this class at the University of Michigan, but I'm sure I'll have to revise it accordingly. Well, I would suggest you don't have to prove everything. You can prove something. <laughs> the thing is to get the ideas across and then yeah. state, the, state the theorems because there's much, you know, this is not going to stand by itself. Anybody who really wants to get into this is going to have to rely on some other texts where things are really proved in, in detail. So this is more just to keep them interested and to show them where it leads and how, how to get it to work for them. Yeah, Why it's thank important. You. Yeah. Thank you for this advice. That, that's a very good idea. Very good idea to, to, to decide what to really prove and what to just to introduce the audience to. Yeah. And the things to prove should be the things to illustrate the ideas and why they're needed. Yeah. Yeah. May I add a couple of things to this yeah. question? Yes, certainly. Yeah, Alex. Mm -hmm. um, so, Asen, you, you are seeking advice on what should be in such a course and what is the, what the subject of such a course is, what variational analysis is, and I'm afraid there is no unique answer to any of these questions. In, in fact, I'm sure that there is no unique answer. And uh, no problem with having an awesome course on variational analysis. And in fact, uh, all those books which you demonstrated in the beginning, they all represented the point of view of the authors. And this is good. We, we need this variety. My worry is, uh, or my interest is a little bit different. So you taught a group of students at Sofia University. You mentioned 10 to 15 students. You also mentioned uh, some cohort of students at uh, Michigan University, engineers, who would potentially be interested in such a course. We are now in a slightly different environment because of this uh, uh, COVID situation when everything is getting online 
what's the point of targeting 10 students in Sofia and uh, another 10 students in Detroit? Why not staging a course, an international course for a broad audience interested in variational analysis and maybe presenting, presenting several versions of variational analysis? So my question to Asen and to the audience, whether you see room for such a development, uh, online courses on variational analysis, or maybe even broader than variational analysis. Uh, I would love to participate in such a project. Can you release such a project? I would, I, would, I, would, I would love to participate, and, but, uh, you know, there... Um, such a project needs a leader. Can you lead such a project and get all those people who potentially could be interested involved? Many people in this room would be interested in participating in such a project. Well, uh, uh, I... I believe your assumption is correct and i'm i would like to listen to other opinions about that are there other opinions i have an opinion um thank you for the sharing this uh, these insights into your view of variational analysis and your your plans for your book um, I was thinking you might be able to make a number of things potentially simpler by restricting yourself to uh, discrete dynamics in the optimal control domain. Mm -hmm. And then potentially even, even keep things finite dimensional. It, it's not an easy, you know, um... It's not an easy, but because, well, my heart is in optimal control of continuous time systems. Yeah. Well, there, there's and a challenge the there. Truth is, the truth is that uh, that's why I consider discrete approximations. And in order to show that you can, you can use the discrete uh, discretization in order to actually solve yeah. uh, a problem. The, my... My uh, uh, experience with uh, this working with these people at University of Michigan Aerospace Department that they, is that they use always in their project, they have examples or applications in continuous time. Mm -hmm. They don't assume in the beginning that they are in discrete time. They come to the discrete time when they discretize, or they use model predictive control, or something like this. Yeah, but, but, but I guess at some, at some level, once they implement any form of control nowadays, that has to be digital, right? And, and it's yes, just the, it's true. And the yeah. sampling and, and okay. so on. And I guess one could either model everything continuously and then discretize slate when you, when you implement the control, mm -hmm. or uh, you, could, you could transition to a discrete formulation early on and then do all the theory also in the discrete domain, which sometimes might, is, might not be as beautiful, yeah. but it, it, it's probably uh, yeah. useful for, for... Okay, uh, sorry, I mean, uh, yeah, we have uh, actually uh, the time past five minutes. And uh, so uh, we can actually communicate maybe, you know, after this session and uh, now, uh, Professor, can you stop sharing the screen and uh, so that our next speaker can share his uh, uh, screen? Okay. Thank you very much, everybody.